Comb filtering gets a pretty bad rap in the live sound industry. Not many folks are fond of the way that it sounds, but it's a phenomenon we have to deal with all the time. And sometimes we're causing them unintentionally. And sometimes we can actually use comb filters to our advantage, for instance, in some specific cardioid sub setups. Bottom line, I want you to come away from today's video not being scared of them. I want you to know why they happen and to what severity. So we're gonna walk through that in five different sections today. First, we're gonna look at the underlying physics of sound that kind of put everything together a little bit. Then we'll jump into defining it truly. So what is a comb filter? Third, we're gonna to listen to what a comb filter sounds like. We're gonna apply some delay to a, a track that I co-produced and would be listening to, to that in and out of the processing. Fourthly, we're gonna run a little experiment here in my studio and I'm gonna use a hard surface to actually intentionally create some reflections and look what that data looks like in SMART and analyze it a little bit. And last, we're gonna talk about how to prevent comb filters and it's gonna come down to one simple thing, timing. Before we define what a comb filter is, we need to understand some underlying fundamentals of how sound actually works in nature. Mainly three attributes which we'll walk through. First is velocity, how fast is sound traveling? Propagation, how much distance is it covering at that given velocity? And frequency, how many times per second is it completing a cycle? I understand that most sound waves or signals that we're working with are complex in nature. It's a bunch of different sounds together, but a lot of the examples are gonna be using just a single sine wave, an up and down wave, uh, maybe at 1K, for example, and be looking how that um, moves through space and study it a little bit. So as a refresher, sound moves at 1130 feet per second or 345 meters per second. And that's in air at about 71 degrees Fahrenheit. And I forget what that is in Celsius, I apologize. But that is gonna be our constant here. So in air, in Earth's atmospheric pressure, that's how fast sound moves. So since that's a constant, we can answer this question. How much time did it take sound to propagate this distance from the speaker here on the left to our measurement microphone here on the right? So if that distance is 1.13 feet or 34.5 centimeters, we can convert that. Because remember, we have our earlier conversion formula of 1130 feet per second. We can convert that to time. So if we go back, that would simply be one millisecond of propagation time. So any time that we see distance, we can also think about time. They are linked at the hip when traveling through a consistent medium like air on Earth. All right, so now let's move on to frequency. Frequency is the number of times per second a sound wave completes a full cycle. So it's a cyclical thing, which we'll, we'll see here in a minute. So this is a sine wave at one hertz. So this is one time per second. It's going up, it has a positive pressure, and it comes back down, and then a negative pressure, then back to our resting atmospheric pressure. So it would do that one time per second. And here's what it looked like for a two hertz wave. So hertz, H-E-R-T-Z, is another is equivalent of cycles per second. So that, that's interchangeable. So you might see two CPS or two hertz, and that's spelled capital H-E-E-R-T-Z after the last name of the scientist who kind of figured this stuff out, I think. Anyway, uh, please fact check me on that. So a two hertz wave would go up and down and complete two full cycles in one second. And equivalent, a four hertz wave would do it four times per second. So with me here? So a 1K tone, so you know when a storm comes, it goes the boop, or that's not the right frequency anyway, but that's just a pure 1K tone. So a thousand times per second, it's going up and down within that one second window. So all that being said, there's a link between time, propagation, and frequency. They're all measured by different ways, but they all relate to one another. So that's why in my audio mass survival spreadsheet, the first three things you see are frequency, period, and wavelength. Period is the same thing as uh, cycle time. And so first we have the frequency, looking at the cycle time, and then the wavelength, which can be equivalent to propagation. So the length of the wave, so a 1K wave for it to go up and down, uh, is gonna also travel 1.13 feet, and that's the, its wavelength from its starting and going through a full cycle. 
All right. So those are kind of the underlying physics we need to have in our brain to understand what happens with a comb filter. So now let's answer that question. What in the world is a comb filter? So if we go back here to our speaker, it's going to our measurement microphone. And this is one millisecond of propagation time from that speaker to that microphone. And let's pretend this black box around our setup here is has a reflection. Now the speaker is hitting that wall uh, on the north side of it and then reflecting back down. And now that propagation path is doubled. So now it's one millisecond to get to the wall, then one millisecond to get back to the microphone. And then both those signals are combining in space at the microphone. So we have a one millisecond path combining with a two millisecond path. In real life, this reflection will be lower in level, but I'm gonna make them both equal just so we can see the data a little bit better. So if we were to look at what that uh, that wave would look like on a transfer function, this is what it would be. So this is a one millisecond of delay or one millisecond delta between a two millisecond propagation path and a one millisecond path. And this is what would happen. We'd get these peaks and valleys at regular intervals. And you can see here, this looks like a comb. This is why it's a comb filter. We have these, these dips going down right here. And that's how it gets its name. So why are we getting these cancellations and these peaks? So we're looking here at one millisecond of delay, and let's first look at this peak right here at 1K or one kilohertz. What, earlier on, we talked about how a one hertz wave completes a cycle one time per second. So equivalently, a 1000 hertz wave would be going through its cycle 1000 times per second. And so a millisecond is one thousandth of a second. So if we just divide that by a thousand, we get to one millisecond. So what's happening is we're actually going through a full cycle and then combining again uh, 360 degrees later and making that peak. Because if we have something that's combining uh, at zero degrees, which we'll look at here in a second with a better graphic, it's gonna combine. Vice versa, if something is combining 180 degrees out of phase, we're going to get a cancellation. So that's what we get here at 500 hertz. So it's 500, it's half of 1K, it is halfway through its cycle, it's going to cancel out. So again, the comb filter calculator on my spreadsheet, you could get the first three dips and the first three peaks by putting in the amount of time offset. So similarly, one milliseconds of delay or time offset, put that here, it's going to tell you those first three. And we can see the relationship here. The first peak we'll start with is the, the, the length of a single period at that amount of time offset. And then we just keep adding it to itself. So 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. And we can see that here. And we're seeing a linear phenomenon over a logarithmic scale. Because if you look at the bottom here, this is frequency. So every doubling in frequency moves up an octave. So that's logarithmic. But this is a linear phenomenon, just 1,000, 2,000. It's not 4,000, 8,000, 16,000. It's just adding another 1,000. So that's the peaks. And the dips, we go down here to 500 and then begin add a thousand, a thousand, a thousand. So if you if you had to think of the deep dips and the peaks, you take the original period time and then add it to itself for peaks. And for the first dip, cut it in half and then add the original period time to move up. So we see these alternating peaks and valleys. So let's take a look at phase a little bit closer now. So this is a sine wave getting drawn as it's moving forward in time at its given phase position. So we're about to come back here to zero degrees. We're at our resting point, moving upwards to 90. We're at the top, coming over to 180. So this is now a half wavelength or halfway through. Now we're at three quarters and now moving back to zero. So if there's two of the same waves at different points in their cycles coming together, depending at what frequency they're at, um, it's going to cancel out in different ways. And this could be described here in the phase wheel. This is a brilliant graphic from Merlin Van Veen. Definitely check out his resources. But we can see here at the top is something is zero degrees offset or 360 degrees or 720 or 1080. They're all going to come back and sum together perfectly. We're going to get a doubling or a 6 dB of addition. And as we move around the phase wheel, we're gonna to start to get less and less addition and we now meet a stalemate at 240 degrees. And that is where we don't, if we have two of the same wave, 120 degrees offset from each other or 240, 
they're not going to, they're just going to stalemate and there's going to be no addition. And then as we move farther offset down towards our danger zone of 180, that means they're going to completely cancel out because they're basically a positive one and a negative one working against each other and they're going to net out to zero. So that's what's happening here is we're seeing frequencies at different points in their period um, all canceling out at a different rate. So if we look at 0.1 milliseconds of propagation time is equivalent to a 10, kilo, tilo, 10 kilohertz wave going through a full cycle. And one millisecond, we, we already looked at as 1K. And then if we now multiply that by 10 again, that's the same thing as 100 hertz. So now let's look at each of those three timing offsets on our magnitude graph. So if you go here to our 0.1 milliseconds of delay, we have our full addition, our 6 dB, and we start falling off until we get our stalemate here, just about 4K. Then here at 5K is boom. We have a big cancellation that is half of our period time, which is 0.1 millisecond, which is equivalent to 10, 10K. And now we have that addition right there. So most of the frequency range is left untouched, but this is where we have our cancellation and our peak. Now, if we move to one millisecond, we already looked at this. Let's now move down a decade and we got 500 Hertz and 1K and we see all these cancellations on top right there. And now we have an even bigger one, a 10 milliseconds of delay. Now we have 50 Hertz canceling out because that is uh, 50 Hertz takes 20 milliseconds of propagation delay to do a full cycle. So that's half of that. Therefore, it's 180 degrees offset. That's our first big cancellation. And then we have our first peak at 100 Hertz because 100 Hertz, it takes 10 milliseconds to complete that cycle. It goes 360 degrees away around and then it combines together. So if we're looking at it visually with different amounts of timing offset, small timing offsets get you a small amount of comb filtering. We're growing larger, even just one millisecond, which doesn't seem like a lot of time, but this is the damage it can do. And this is 10 milliseconds. We move that comb filter way down low, and now we're getting a lot of uh, cancellation throughout the entire frequency spectrum. I will say these are two waves that are equal in level and the only thing different about them and one is slightly delayed and then we combine the two and this is what we're seeing. So we all in the field, the comb filtering that we're dealing with isn't always equal in level, but it's still doing some sort of harm um, to our signal by having that copy of the signal add back in and add these peaks and valleys to our signal. We can use comb filters for good, or at least for a purpose that we need in certain situations, namely some cardioid subarrays, and we can get cancellation where we want it, but that's not always desirable. So comb filters are inherently bad, but you don't want them showing up where you can't control or you're uh, not aware of them and you're chasing the wrong thing to try and correct the problem because it looks like a frequency-based problem, an electronic problem, when it's actually a timing problem. So what we can't do is take an equalizer and simply hammer this all in and reduce, reduce, bring this up, bring this up. It's, it's the wrong tool for the wrong job. Now, what does a comb filter sound like? So if this is still unfamiliar to you, I'm gonna play a track that I actually helped produce with a local artist, the verse of it, and we're gonna be popping between first the, the regular untouched and then with a 10 millisecond delayed copy of itself creating a comb filter back to the regular then back to the comb filter copy let's listen you were lying on a rooftop bathed in starlight you were an eight hour drive wide knuckles on a friday night Oh, I could hear your Mustang from a mile away Heart rate at a hundred when you exited the freeway You and now let's run a real-time experiment where I'm going to intentionally create a comb filter uh, in the physical space. The earlier examples I showed you were electronic. I just took a signal and delayed it, uh, but we don't always see the data that clean and cut. So what does a comb filter look like in real life? So I've got a simple single speaker and my measurement microphone here, they're about a foot away from each other. But what if I take a really hard surface, like my old MacBook, and put it right under here and intentionally create a reflection and let's look at some of that data. 
So for our demo here, we're gonna use smart, do a simple transfer function, and also have our setup right here, a measurement microphone, my little trusty speaker here, and a hard reflective surface, aka my wife's ancient iPad from college. So I'm gonna put this here, and we're gonna see the sound bounce from here, the tweeter, up to the microphone, and that's gonna create a reflection. As you can see around me, I don't have uh, a lot of reflections coming because I have a lot of sound panels. And this is gonna give us a nice coherent measurement to start out with. And we'll start introducing some reflections intentionally and see what that looks like. So we'll fire up our signal generator. And we'll capture this as our baseline trace. So we can see the coherence is very high, meaning there's not much noise in the data at all. And as we start to move this, this surface around in front of it and create reflections, we're gonna see two things happen. We're gonna, or actually three. We're gonna see another little peak up here appear because we're actually seeing a copy of the signal come. So it's gonna change our impulse response. We're gonna see our phase response change because that's the timing of the, the frequencies. We're gonna have another time arrival, right? And we're gonna see our coherence drop and see our comb filter pattern come up here in the high frequencies. Again, we don't have that much of a time offset, so we're not gonna see this deep, deep, low comb filter, but we'll see what we got. So let's try it out. So let's look at our data here. I captured it when I had the iPad creating a pretty big reflection. And we can see that here in the second little peak that's coming, this is a copy of the signal. And we also see our comb filtering right here happening in the top end. So that's a copy of the signal arriving later then combining and giving us those peaks and valleys. So final experiment that you can run yourself uh, with, your, with your own measurement gear. Just wanna show you what that looked like in real life, introducing the reflections and take them away. And as I moved around the iPad, we saw the comb filter move back and forth in space, which I thought was pretty cool. Now that we understand comb filters and how they work a little bit more, how can we prevent them when we do not want them? The number one word you gotta keep in mind is reflection. Comb filters can happen through electronic means like the examples I showed on earlier, but all that is, it's a reflection of the, the audio coming in and combining with itself again. So this could be a bad delay um, on your let's say uh, you're sending out your stream feed to a video switcher. I've done this before. We have to add some delay because the video is a little bit late and I have forgotten to delay both channels of my stream. So I had to delay 100 milliseconds on my left. I forgot it on the right. If that gets summed down to mono somewhere, that's gonna sound super wonky. So don't. So from an electronic standpoint, make sure anytime you have delays in between something to sync those up. The same thing goes with a snare drum, a, a uh, overhead mic and a close mic. It's a good idea to delay your close snare mic to your overheads because that those are two very correlated signals. They're both getting the snare drum at, I, in, uh, in my mind, at the highest level. That's the drum that's gonna be the highest in both microphones. So you're gonna have to delay that close snare mic a couple milliseconds so they match up, so you're not getting a comb filtering just because the time the snare drum has to travel. And then lastly, if you have a speaker in a given space, just have a look around and see where is the sound bouncing off things from the speakers? Is it closest to the ceiling, the floor, the walls? How can I get speakers either farther away from these, uh, from these reflective boundaries? Or conversely, if you have to get them close, I would actually get your speakers as close to that surface as possible because that's reducing the amount of delta between the speaker, the wall, and coming back. That's called speaker boundary interference uh, response. 
And we can reduce that by putting speakers very close. So uh, I would say if you have a choice of having a speaker up to seven feet away or more, you're in the clear. But if you're closer than about seven feet to a surface, I would see if you can actually put the speaker all the way up to the wall. Yes, you're going to get some lows and low mids coupling against the wall and coming back, but you can fix that with a low shelf and bring it down. So those are all instances where our comb filtering can happen if you set your delay wrong uh, when combining signals like a program feed and maybe delaying your snare drum microphone to your overheads or uh, reducing the amount of timing offset between the speakers and their boundaries by getting really close to the surface or getting them away from the surface. All right, that's it for today. I hope you understand comb, filter, comb filters a little bit better and how they happen. Again, the name of the game is just looking at the timing offset of correlated or similar signals and reducing that as much as possible. If you uh, enjoyed some of the graphs uh, and data I showed you from my Audio Mass Survival spreadsheet, you can get that at the link below. My name is Michael Curtis. Thank you so much for hanging out today and I will see you next time.